Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So, as a lot of you know, Daily Declaration uh, 111 is called My World Grows Strong in Thankfulness. And I'm going to read that one out, just in case people haven't seen it, and it's always good. It says, Thank you, Father, for your favor and love being poured out upon my heart. My heart and soul grow strong in thankfulness. I don't know if I've ever thought about that, but our heart and soul grow strong in thankfulness, in the thankfulness. This is a weapon of such great power that Satan and his demons recoil in confusion every time I use thankfulness as a defense weapon or as an offensive weapon. My heart sings for joy every time I reflect on all the loving kindnesses that you have bestowed on me and in so many events in my life. I want the whole world to know you and rejoice in your love. With this weapon of thankfulness, I can block Satan's broadcasts of fears, doubts, regrets, shame, ridicule, accusations, condemnations, and all thoughts of vendetta. Demons bow in fear of me. In a heart of thankfulness, I am free to enjoy my family, friends, acquaintances, and neighbors. I do not have to judge them, undermine them, envy them, or even lust after anything they own. I am able to enjoy the good qualities that I find everywhere in life and in people. Demonic attacks end as I declare my thankfulness to you, Father. With true thankfulness, I can be truly authentic, real, genuine, and a true light for the kingdom of God to a world that needs Yeshua. With true thankfulness, lies, deception, and selfish desire are quickly discerned and rejected. So we get discernment through thankfulness. Shame cannot hold me down or block me from stepping forward. And with great joy, Father, I thank you that you, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit reside in my spirit man, assuring me eternal life and the completion of the good work Yeshua has started in me. To your glory, Father, we honor you in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. 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 So our topic is thankfulness, but what I want to do is I'm going to just give a little bit of an introduction here. It's something that... Um, I've been studying because of some things happening at work, but it, it, it definitely comes when we are students of the Word of God. So students, children in our family as they're growing, they're students, are they not? They are students because they are learning, and we are told as parents that we are to teach them all the time. When we sit down, when we stand up, when we go here, when we go there, it's teaching, teaching, teaching. And, of course, we do that uh, with grandchildren. We do that with nieces and nephews and everything. You are supposed to do that. You are the adult. That's what you are to do. And uh, the word student in Hebrew means to learn. So a child is like a student, to learn. And then we have the next word is education. And when we think of education, let's just take it to post-secondary education. That word means dedication. If somebody goes on to post-secondary education, they have a dedication to learn a topic. And so they may have learned something before in school, in high school or whatever, let's say it's chemistry, but now they've dedicated themselves to learn something specific. Or they may have taken welding and shop class, but now they learn something specific. They go and spend time on it. Be pressure welding. Be pressure welding. That's right. That takes a while. Um, so then what happens is, as you do that, you gain knowledge. Good, bad, or indifferent, you gain knowledge, right? So you gain knowledge, and the Hebrew word for knowledge is made up of the Hebrew letters meaning door, like the door that hangs on a tent, right? It also means that it moves back and forth or in and out. It's, that's what it is, um, knowledge. And it also is I, the I that you see with. So those two letters combined mean the back and forth movement of the eye. Something is carefully examined. So you're gaining knowledge on something. You are carefully examining it. Every, uh, the one moves the eye back and forth to take in the whole of what is being examined. So you can think of that as the Bible. You study the Bible, you gain knowledge, your eye moves back and forth, you're examining. And in the ancient Hebrew mind, this careful examination is understood as knowledge and experience on an intimate level. So people will take chemistry or 
you know, I say chemistry and welding because they kind of go together. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing both. Um, you, you examine it, you, you study it, you practice. The more knowledge you gain, the, uh, the no more you know about that subject. And so in Job 37, 16, it says, Do you know and have the knowledge of the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of the complete knowledge? So it's talking about a knowledge, a knowing. Do you recall the letters of the Hebrew word for knowledge? Uh, Y-A-D-A. Oh, Y-A-D-A. Yada, 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 yada. Knowledge is the intimate ability to perform a specific task or function. So you gain knowledge and something to do that. Also, the complete workings and intimacy of knowing someone. So the ancient Hebrew meaning of knowledge is to know. The idea of knowing a person um, and an intimate knowing of a person. So we may say that we know someone, but that just means we know they exist. So people will say, oh yeah, I know that person. They're a friend of my friend. Well, that's just knowledge. Right? That's not intimate, right? They don't know anything about that person. So to say that you know someone in Hebrew means that in the Hebrew thought that you know someone if they have a personal and intimate relationship, a very close relationship. In Genesis 18, 19, God says that he knows Abraham, meaning a close relationship with Abraham. In Genesis 4, it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, implying a very intimate sexual relationship. In Psalm 9:11, it says, And those knowing your character will trust in you, for you will not leave those seeking Yeshua. It's an intimate knowing. In Psalm 44, 21, it says, Will not God search this, for he knows the secrets of the heart? That is an intimate knowing of your heart. Do we know God in this same manner? Do we know the heart of God? In 1 John 2, verse 3, And by this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. So that's how you get to know God, have knowledge of God, and to know him on an intimate, more intimate level is by keeping his commandments. So through the perspective of the Hebrew mind, it would read, and by this we may be sure that we have an intimate relationship with him if we preserve his directions, his path. Right? The way. We call it the way. The way. The next thing that comes up is you get some knowledge. Well, we would know what happens when we send people off to university and they get some knowledge. They think they know everything. Right? They know everything about everything. Well, they know something about a certain topic. Right? But they have to take that now, and they have to get some understanding on it. So whether you're in the chemistry class at the university, or you're welding over at a technical college, you actually have to apply that knowledge, that book learning that you have, and you actually have to try it out. You have some book learning so that you, A, don't cut off your fingers, or blow yourself up, right? But you, there is some learning that you have to do, where you have to take that knowledge now and get some understanding of how things work together. And I think of, whether it's welding or whatever it is, is that um, it depends on the weather outside. Is it damp? Is it dry? It, atmosphere makes a big difference. So that brings in where you have to have an understanding of what you've learned. So the Hebrew word for understanding comes from a verb, verbal root meaning um, to understand, but the deeper meaning of this word is in the root that means build. So you're building on what you've already learned. You're building on concepts. In order to build or construct something, you must have the ability to plan, but you have to understand the processes, right? You have to understand, have a deeper understanding of those processes. This is the idea behind it, and it's to discern the processes of that construction of whatever you're doing. So we see this with people who say, oh, I've read the Bible. Well, maybe they did. They have a knowledge of what they read and retained in the Bible, but do they really understand it? Are they able to build precept upon precept, and can they discern the process of the workings of the Word of God? That is a big difference. And then the next thing we have is wisdom. 
So now that you have an understanding of something, you have some workings of it, you're out there processing it, you're planning it, you're trying it out, then there's this whole thing of wisdom. I've used two very physical things, chemistry and welding. But when you take people who have gone into humanities or into human ecology and they come out of university, they're dealing with people. You need a lot of wisdom, but you still need a lot of wisdom with things that are physical because you can get hurt if you don't do things right. Wisdom in Hebrew is a relationship word. The parent word in Hebrew is H-H-A-M, and it means heat. So the root of wisdom has this root of heat in it. You apply heat to something. So this word appears in, the, um, in pictures as a wall and water. And when you combine these two words, you literally mean separate water. In other words, when you apply heat to the water, you separate water and it's evaporation, right? So the following Hebrew words all derive from this parent root of heat when you apply heat to it. A skin bag, it's, it, this is a riddle, you guys. I want you to know if you figure how this goes together. You, you will. Skin bag, cheese, sun, to shake, to crave and desire, and to sour. All those words have the root word in heat. <laughs> well, well, we can plainly see the root at the beginning of each word is that word for heat. What we may not see as plainly is how all these meanings relate to one another. So sour milk is placed in a skin bag that is set out in the heat of the sun and it's shaken. And the natural enzymes in the skin bag causes the water to separate from the milk forming the delicacy cheese. They stop there, but I would say that there's a little bit of craving and desire for cheese. I forgot that as well. <laughs> so, what does all this have to do with wisdom? It's related to the idea of separating. As this word means, one who is able to separate things out. When you have wisdom, you're able to take the knowledge and the understanding that you have gained over time, um, and you are able to separate out Okay, what can I keep? What, do, what does not belong here? What is of a good report? What is not of a good report? Right? Yes, go ahead. I think Shelby and I share this information, the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Exactly. 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 Right? Absolutely. So a wise person is one who's able to separate things. There is a word for wisdom um, that in Hebrew, S-H-A-C-A-L, that has no intimacy. It's not knowing the person's heart. The word means knowledge of something that has no intimate relationship with that knowledge, no understanding. And really, the knowledge of good and evil is just, that knowledge is just stuff. It's just knowledge. It's not an intimate, it's not wisdom. It's flesh. Flesh wisdom. Uh, ra uh, human rational thinking okay. rather than God thinking. Okay. Like, I want you to go back. The word uh, yada yeah. is yaw the. Okay. God knows. God knows. This is okay. something that God knows and he's giving it to you. Therefore, it is knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. God knows. Wisdom of God is God, God knowledge. And... Mm -hmm. Whereas the tree of good and evil is human fleshly reasoning. You're right. It's ra rational. Rational. Okay. <coughs> and when you go into wisdom, wisdom is the aspect of taking God's knowledge and learning how to work with it and get wisdom. Mm -hmm. it, it's applied. Applied. Applied the, no applied the knowledge God gives you. Right. To, uh, then you gain wisdom. Okay. Understanding is the testing, that this is tested by the heat and proven true. Right. It's, it's been, it's gone through all the yards of mm -hmm. trial and error, and that this is what's proven true. Right. Okay. And that's how you get that understanding. And, and, and that's why these words flow the way they do. Yeah, yeah, they did flow together, right? <coughs> Sorry, that's Hugo. Why I, I find, like, when if I read something in a book, 
you, you, you might think you know it, but you mm -hmm. don't really truly know it until you go and apply it in life. Mm -hmm. And that's how you really learn is by putting it into actual practical application. Well, you, yeah, you have to, and that's Test putting, yeah. that's testing it, that's putting heat to it. That, that's to the make only it way you truly learn something. Yeah, and have wisdom in the workings of it. Yes. Speaking of heat and separation, Jeremiah 15, 19 says, And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. So we right. have to extract and separate what's right, what's wrong, yeah. how does it fit together. Yeah, exactly. Um, another word for wisdom is C-H-A-K-E-M-A-H. -E and it's wisdom that comes from an intimacy of knowing one's heart. A wise relationship between a husband and a wife is where the husband knows and understands her heart. And she knows and understands his heart. A relationship where intimacy of that person's heart allows wisdom to affect and operate in their choices, actions, decisions for each other, right? And you can see over time how that will change. So a child, if we, we go to thankfulness, a child has been taught to say thank you, but that's just empty, right? If you don't teach them what that means, right? So the ed, um, education says that you, um, You've had an education into saying thank you. Well, saying thank you well because it's polite. Or so you said thank you, so you d didn't uh, get whacked in the back of the head or embarrassed in front of a stranger. You said thank you, right? You said thank you to your parents so that you could have that cookie that they were dangling in front of your face. Or people say thank you through mockery, right? They'll say, oh, gee, thanks, right? So that's just, uh, that's that, you know, you can have some knowledge of it, but you don't understand anything. That's why I taught Veronica to say a million thank yous of gracious ones. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so just saying thanks doesn't mean you're thankful. Right, Veronica? <laughs> so my world grows strong in thankfulness this declaration how does your world go grow strong through thankfulness so thankfulness generally people think of thankfulness meaning a choir of singers a celebration of thanksgiving like for a harvest thanksgiving a sacrifice in thanksgiving um, peace offering will come up under this and also um, at the extension of your hand like when you extend your hand that is considered thankfulness, adoration in a choir of worshipers. And the yod is the word for, it's a letter, it's a word for the hand. The hand, the yeah, yeah. And that's thankfulness, right? In Nehemiah 12, 46, it says, For in the days of David and Asher, in ancient times, there were leaders of the singers, songs of praise and songs of thankfulness to God. So thanksgiving is T-O-D-A-H. It's ta, and it's as D-A-L-E-T-H, dalet, or <laughs> is D-A-L-E-T-H, dalet, or is dalet. it dalet, right? And he, H-E-I. So the people of Israel in this scripture are now regathered to their land after 70 years of captivity, and they're being commanded to sing songs of praise and thanksgiving. So we think of praise as worship, right? Showing honor and showing respect, uh, making God shine. And we think of it even as thanksgiving, right? The word thanksgiving stands alone and is separate in this verse from praise. So it's singled out. That Hebrew word thanksgiving, the root of it is the word, is the, what we said, ya, ya, da, right? And it means an intimacy. So there's a thanksgiving, there's an intimacy in this thanksgiving. It is thanksgiving that leads us to intimacy with God. The Hebrew word for thanksgiving spelled out ta, T-A-W, which is the letter for truth. Jesus said that he is the truth. The next letter is dalet, which means a doorway. And the third letter, hey, H-E-I, which is the presence of God, right? So the truth, the door, he is the truth, the door, the presence of God. Our thanksgiving to Yeshua for his sacrifice on the cross leads us to a doorway or portal to the presence of God and the intimacy of God. 
Our world grows strong in thankfulness as we gain the knowledge and understanding of what he did for us on the cross. The truth and understanding of the power and significance of the Sabbath day which he pours himself into. Knowledge and understanding of the Sabbath covenant. The Sabbath is the doorway, is a doorway to God, intimacy with him. Thankfulness is is a doorway to the presence and intimacy with him. To thank him for what he has done, there has to be a knowledge and an understanding, a knowing and understanding of God's heart, an intimacy of who he is and all he is. We learn that through truth, right? We learn that through truth. Truth of him, the Sabbath day, and the Sabbath covenant. Now, as we give praise and thanksgiving to him on the Sabbath day, and he pours himself into the day he made for man, we have an intimacy. We will grow in intimacy in this day. He made a day of intimacy and a day to come to know him intimately, a day of thanksgiving. So I want to read a testimony from an article when I looked up the scripture in Nehemiah. This man gave a testimony. He said, I learned the importance of thanksgiving during one of the darkest periods in my life. I got wiped out just as, old, as Job got wiped out. On my way to my parents' house, on top of this, on the way to my parents' house, my car broke down, the engine was cooked. On top of everything, I now had no car. A tow truck took me into Michigan City, where I had left the remains of my car with a mechanic. I mentioned I was going to Chicago, and if I could get to the South Shore train station, I could take the train to Chicago, catch the blue line to O'Hara O'Hara Airport. My parents were in walking distance of the airport. Someone overheard me and she offers to get me to the train sta station as she needs some good karma. Karma, mitzvah, I didn't care, I needed a ride. <laughs> when I got to the airport and walked into the terminal, memories of the many trips I took out of that terminal came flooding back. Life was so joyful, hopeful, and filled with great anticipation in those days. Now life was only filled with hurt, disappointment, pain, and sorrow. I sat down, hanging my head in despair, which I suddenly heard the saxophone man. Every time I flew out of that terminal, I saw the old boy with a saxophone in an open saxophone case, and he would play a wide variety of songs, including the old Boots Ralph songs. Many, as well as myself, would throw coins and dollar bills in his saxophone case to show our appreciation. This time, the saxophone man's playing was greatly improved, and I suspected it was improved because he was playing an inspirational song. And I could tell he was playing that song from his heart, for he was practically making that saxophone sing. As I sat listening to the music, my mind was playing out the lyrics. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Yeshua his son. And now, may the weak say I am strong, may the poor say I am rich, because of what Yeshua has done. I moved away to a corner where I was hidden from the crowd, and I leaned against the wall. I just sank to my knees, weeping and thanking God that nothing changed with him. As I wept out all the things I could think of that I was thankful for, the joy of Yeshua returned. That is why I really emphasize thanksgiving, and I suppose why Nehemiah also emphasized it, for it is truly a door, a portal to God's presence. Oh, by the way, oh, oh, by the way, I went searching for the saxophone man to drop a generous gift in a saxophone case, but I couldn't find him. I asked a security guard who told me that sadly, the saxophone man passed away a month earlier, as he wistfully said, yeah, we all miss him. And, no, he did not hear any saxophone music. So Yeshua came to him right there in that time. But it was Thanksgiving that had the, the power to bring him out. So where do we start with Thanksgiving? In Psalm 100, it says, Shout joyfully to Yeshua all the earth. Serve Yeshua with jubilation. And jubilation is a word that you can go on forever studying into. Quickly, very briefly, repentance is part of jubilation, and it brings you the year of jubilee, of freedom. Repentance is freedom, right? And you can call on recompense and redemption when you have repentance. 
So serve Yeshua with jubilation. Come before him with rejoicing. Know that Yeshua himself is God. I think that takes a lot of thought and a lot of um, meditation. He is God. It is he who has made us and not we who have made ourselves. We have not made ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For Yahshua is good. That's another one we can meditate on. A lot of people don't think Yahshua is good. They think he gives and he takes away. Right? His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. So we, here we have a list of items that we are told is a reason to be thankful to express thanksgiving. One, that Yeshua is God. Two, he's the creator that made us, not ourselves. Three, he's chosen us and we are his people, his followers. Four, that Yeshua is good. Period. There's nothing after that. <laughs> um, five, his mercy never runs out. And six, his faithfulness to us and to all generations. He is faithful. The other psalm is Psalm 107. Give thanks to Yeshua, for he is good, for his mercy is everlasting. The redeemed of Yeshua shall say so, those whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered from the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness as a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their souls felt weak within them. When they cried out to Yeshua in their trouble, he saved them from all their distresses. I think we can know that we've been saved from a lot of distresses. He also had them walk on a straight way to go to an inhabited city. They, uh, they shall give thanks to Yeshua for his mercy and for his wonders to the sons of mankind. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, he's filled the hungry soul. If you have a thirsty and you're a hungry soul, it's a pretty empty feeling, isn't it, when it's empty? Um, but he's filled it with good. There were those who lived in darkness, in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and rejected the plan of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to Yeshua in their trouble. He saved them from all their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. They shall give thanks to Yeshua for his mercy and for his wonders to the sons of mankind. For he has shattered the gates of the bronze, cut off the bars of iron. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their guilty deeds, were afflicted. Their souls loathed all kind of food, and they came close to the gates of death. Then they cried out to Yeshua in their trouble. He saved them from all their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and saved them from their destruction, their own destruction. They shall give thanks to Yeshua for his mercy and for his wonders to the sons of mankind. They shall also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of Yeshua and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised a stormy wind which lifted the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken person and were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to Yeshua in their trouble and he brought them out of all their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired harbor. They shall give thanks to Yeshua for his mercy and for his wonders to the sons of mankind. They shall also exalt him in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. He turns rivers into wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground and a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns a wilderness into a pool of water and dry land into springs of water and he has the hungry live there so that they may establish an inhabited city, and sows fields, and plants vineyards, and gathers a fruitful harvest. 
He also blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not allow their cattle to decrease. When they become few and lowly because of oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pulls, pours out contempt upon noble men and makes them wander in a path in a pathless wasteland. But he sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction, and makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but all injustice shuts its mouth. And today we declare that all injustice shuts its mouth against Gerald and against Pastor James Coates in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 So who is wise? He is to pay attention to these things and consider the mercy of Yeshua. So who is wise? Who can separate things? Who has dedicated themselves to the knowing of the knowledge of God and who has gained understanding through applying that knowledge of God and allowed some heat to be applied to it? Who is wise? The wise pay attention to the words of this song because it says, Who is wise? He is to pay attention to these things and consider the mercy of Yeshua. So the wise pay attention to the words of this song and they consider the mercy of Yeshua. How much do we consider the mercy and how great the mercy is? So, what in Psalm 107 are we to pay attention to? Well, one, give thanks to Yeshua. Two, Yeshua is good. Three, his mercy is everlasting. Four, he's redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Five, he saved us from all of our distresses. He said it four times. He leads us on the straight way. He has us to inhabit a city. He said that twice. He gives, uh, give thanks to Yeshua for his mercy. Four times we are told to give thanks for his mercy. Uh, nine, give thanks to Yeshua for his wonders to the sons of mankind. Four times he said that. He satisfies the thirsty soul. Eleven, he satisfies the hungry soul. Twelve, he brings us out of darkness. And thirteen, he brings us out of the shadow of death. Fourteen, he's healed us. Fifteen, he saved us from destruction. Sixteen, it says, tell of all his works. Seventeen, offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Eighteen, sing joyfully. Nineteen, he guides us to our desired harbor. Twenty, exalt him in the congregation. Twenty-one, praise him at the seat of the elders. Twenty-two, he turns our wilderness into a pool of water. Twenty-three, the dry land into springs of water. Twenty-four, he gives us sown fields, planted vineyards, and a fruitful harvest. Right? Vineyards you did not plant. Wells you did not dig. Twenty-five, he multiplies us greatly. Twenty-six, none of our animals decrease. Twenty-seven, he defends us from those who oppress us, bringing us misery and sorrow. He defends us from those who do that. Twenty-eight, he sets us on high, away from affliction. Twenty-nine, our families flourish. Thirty, all injustice comes, all injustice against us shuts its mouth. And thirty-one, Yeshua is merciful. So are we wise? Have we paid attention to these things? Have we separated what Satan, a fallen angel, keeps lying to us about from what Yeshua accomplished in the shedding of his blood? What the spotless lamb, the second Adam, the king of kings, the bridegroom, the redeemer has done for us? All that was accomplished. In Matthew 16, 19, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you will loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And in Revelation 1.18, And the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Yeshua has given us the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and he retrieved the keys of death and Hades. In other words, death and anything of death has no hold on us. Death has been conquered. Are you wise? When the heat's applied, what does your tongue speak? Does it speak in thankfulness? There is a list of biblical examples of people showing gratitude. 
in 2 Samuel, David thanks God for his kingdom. So this is kind of an outline of what we can thank. The, any list of thankfulness is endless. But you may find some categories that you would like to make a thankful list for. Uh, David thanks God for his kingdom in 2 Samuel. In 1 Chronicles 29, David thanked God for wealth. In Psalm 118, the psalmist thanks God for salvation. In Psalm 119, the psalmist thanks God for his laws. Um, in Daniel 2.23, Daniel thanks God for wisdom and power. In Luke 17.16, the healed Samaritan leper thanks Jesus. Um, Jesus gives thanks for a meal in Matthew 15. I have a recipe book that I made when I was 17, which was only a couple years ago, you know. But anyway, it's been in there for a long time, let's put it that way. And the other day, about two weeks ago, I decided to actually look at it. And I just thought it was really neat, because it was from my great-grandma Oldfield, who probably died in the 1940s, I'm thinking. I didn't look it up. But I liked it, because her handwriting was a pen and ink that was in her recipe book. And I just thought, oh, that's cute, and put it in there. Well, we now say it, because I actually read it. But I want to add to it, and we do add to it. But it says, Heavenly Father, we ask that thy blessing may rest on us while we partake of this food. Enable us to receive it in gratitude and act in thy services, in thy service, for Yahshua's sake. Amen. She used Jesus, but, yeah. Very interesting, right? Uh, eight, Jesus thanks God to de uh, that he demonstrates his authority. Right before raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus thanks God for hearing him. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So he gives a thanks as a testimony, as an act of faith, of faith, to build faith. Paul gives thanks to God for bread and safety in Acts. Uh, Paul thanks God for Christian fellowship in Rome in Acts 28. Paul thanks God for the Christian church and the members and the friends, and he does that in many verses. We see that he thanks God for that. And Paul thanks God for spiritual gifts like the speaking in tongues and things like that in um, the Bible. So, in 1 Colossians, uh, no, not 1, sorry, I have a number one here. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, it says, Therefore, as you have received Yeshua, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and being built up in him. See, being built up is kind of that understanding of him, right? And established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Overflowing with gratitude. There's a big step up from thank you so you can get your cookie. <laughs> it's a big step up. How do we become firmly rooted and built up? Education, understanding, that build up, to step out and allow some heat to be applied so that we can separate what is of God and what is of the fallen angel. That we can gain wisdom and grow our faith. So in other words, when something goes wrong, what I've done at work is I did, a, I started my thank you list for Purim by just saying thank you for work. And I have a hundred things on that list. And as I got to a hundred, I had more that I could add. Now there's a couple, there's a situation at work. We'll just call it a situation. And what, well, the situation is that strife is over the school. And I'm starting to see it in all little places. And I did not do well yesterday uh, in one situation. And I was doing this stuff on thankfulness, and I was like, why didn't I just go to thankfulness right away? But you know, you know, with strife on the, <laughs> I'll blame it on the strife on the roof, yeah. Um, somebody came around the corner and said, well, what are you doing? And accusing me and my, my colleague of just walking up and starting ripping things off the wall like we had never asked anyone, like, like we just, you know, Right away, I was like, what do you think? I don't have a brain? Like, you, you, it wasn't even that I didn't have a brain. Like, you would think that my character is so low that I would come here in the middle of the school, wipe everything off of this bulletin board, 
and didn't ask anyone, right? It, it didn't go that slow. It went a lot faster in my head. And um, so she said, well, you're going to put that poster up, right? And I'm thinking, why would I put that poster up when I'm putting something on this bulletin board? Wait, you know. Anyway, of course, we had got all the permissions that we needed. We had got all the steps had been done. We were actually doing a job for someone else who can't be in the office. Like, this has all been all taken care of. But anyway, I did not react well. <laughs> I didn't react horribly bad, but you could tell the strife was there. You could tell it was there. But we are to go straight into thankfulness. We're to go straight into the word Yeshua. At least say Yeshua, right, when a situation happens. And we are to be aware of these things and to say, thank you, Father in heaven, you're going to redeem this situation. Thank you for the words to speak. Thank you for patience. Thank you for your love. Touch me with your love now. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> and, um, but these are things that build up, right? The strife's been building up and building up because of all the lockdowns and everything. And because how people are taking that too. And in a school you have even more restrictions than ever. So, um, and it's taken out all the joy. So anyway, but that's an example of how firmly rooted are we in that understanding and that intimacy with God that when something comes at us that we can speak out in thankfulness and not get upset with that person. You know, that person, it, first of all, is walking in fear, doesn't know God. And so... Why am I upset with them? <laughs> anyway, um, in 2 Corinthians, thankfulness is mentioned 16 times in 13 chapters. And there is, I just want to tell you that. I guess I just want to tell you that. Um, actually, in Colossians, thankfulness is mentioned nine times in four chapters. There is a note, though, that I just want to say that do not offer God thanksgiving for things that are not in his word and those that are contrary to his word. In Amos 5.22, it says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you may offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I do not accept them, and the peace offering of your fattened animals I do not look upon. So you can give what you think is a gift of thankfulness or a peace offering and God doesn't even look at it. So in other words, you can thank God all you want with Christmas carols, but he's not going to look at them as thanks. Not going to happen. So, it says that the eyes um, the eyes are the window of our soul. We were talking about a thirsty soul and a hungry soul and all that kind of stuff. But what are we putting in front of our eyes? that are feeding our soul? Are we educating ourselves in the Word of God? What are we educating ourselves in? What's in front of our face? What are we gaining in deep knowledge of? You know, we can put knowledge in front of our face that's mockery, fear, accusations, lies, hatred, comparison, falsehood, perversion, whatever. You can put that in front of your face, right? But what are you doing? Are we stepping out and applying what we have a knowledge about and building that understanding? Are we thankful when some heat's applied to that knowledge and understanding so we can gain some wisdom? Step out and apply with the commandments, the direction that the Word has given us. Be thankful for all that Yeshua has done. At Pure, we were asked to make a list for thanks of thankfulness. Did we heed the command and the direction? I want to give a summary of da uh, the Daily Declaration 111 that I read at the beginning. One, thankfulness is a defense weapon. Two, thankfulness blocks Satan's broadcasts of fear, doubt, regret, shame, ridicule, accusation, condemnation, and vendetta. Three, the demons bow in fear to thankfulness. Four, thankfulness allows us to enjoy the good qualities in life and in people. Because that's where we're focused, right? That's where we focus. Actually, Jalen was talking about that scripture where you look in a mirror, and then when you go away, you, don't, you forget the image, right? When we have thankfulness, it brings remembrance to us so that we don't forget the good things. We don't forget who we are. Um... 
but we don't forget who other people are when we're thankful. That list of a hundred things at work that I'm thankful for when things go wrong, I go, yeah, but I got a hundred things to be thankful for. I don't have to even remember what's on the list, right? I go, I have a hundred things I can be thankful for. That just changes your attitude right there, right? So if you have somebody that you have an issue with, a situation, try to like, write a list of a hundred things that you are positive about that person that you're thankful for. And it can't be, I am really thankful they're in pain. It can't be that. That's not thankful. <laughs> it can't be, I have a hundred things I'm thankful for, and one of them is not you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it can't be that either. No, that would be vendetta. That's not thankful. <laughs> Five, declarations of thankfulness and demonic attacks. Six, thankfulness allows us to be truly authentic, real, and genuine. Seven, thankfulness allows us to be a light, a true light, for the kingdom of God. Eight, thankfulness brings discernment. And nine, thankfulness allows us to reject shame and to step forward. So to step forward past that blockage, that heat that's coming on you, that, you know, just like that guy on the plane, right? He had the thankfulness and then he could step forward. He stepped forward. And it was the thankfulness that allowed him to step forward. When the heat's applied, step forward in the straight way of Yeshua. Be wise and declare thankfulness that death is defeated and declare all that was established, accomplished, and complete through the mercy and the love of Yeshua at the cross. Amen.